Good Thursday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com Mailbag Podcast, brought to you by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Check them out online at BlueWaterClimateControl.com. And don't forget, their free furnace deal is back for the month of February. They're giving away 20 furnaces with complete system installs. It's first come, first serve. How much will you save? Well, that's the best part. Normally, they cap the savings at $1,000, but this time, there is no cap. So if you've been waiting for that high-efficiency system with all the bells and whistles, now's the time. Just give them a call, 865-299-2290, or go to bluewaterclimatecontrol.com to book online. They'll come out and give you a quote on your new American Standard Heating and Air System. That's the free furnace deal going on in the month of February, they're giving away 20 of those. So if you're interested, check them out online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com. With Rob Lewis and Austin Bryce, I'm Brent Hubs. We'll jump right to the questions. There's plenty of them. And we'll start with the most popular question on the general's quarters these days. Anybody got any nuggets on a defensive coordinator search? Chicken McNuggets. <laughs> no, those left with the last half. Um, you know, I don't have anything. I don't have anything new. I mean, I, we know that Josh Heupel and, Kevin Steele have had some conversations. Um, I still believe that there's some candidates out there that nobody knows about at this point in time. I know a lot of people are wondering, you know, is, are they just waiting to signing days over? We talked about that in the Monday podcast. Uh, perhaps signing day is now over. So does news get moving in the, in the next, you know, 24 to 48 hours or by the weekend? One would think, Austin, that this thing does start to move. And I don't think it's just because signing day is over, but surely this thing gets to some kind of a completion in terms of the staff or, or at least that part of the staff uh, by the end of the weekend, one would think, I mean, it, it's at some point in time, you got to make a call and you got to roll forward on defense. Cause I would say that goal. Tennessee's, I would say that Tennessee's staff will be 90% if not com- totally complete when Josh Heupel uh, comes to office, he comes to his office on Monday morning. Now, I think a good portion of these guys will start trickling over the next few days. Again, I, we said it on the board. You know, I, I believe Cody Burns will be a part of this staff sooner rather than later. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, we'll see what they do with the running back spot, Brent. That's something I continue to hear. It doesn't look like the Merritt guy that he had hired from James Madison uh, will be an on-the-field coach here at Tennessee um, that, you know, that, they'll look to go in a different direction at running back and we'll see what happens defensive coordinator. I have no clue. I mean, I really don't. Again, I keep going back to either he's got his guy and that person's kept it extremely quiet outside of maybe his, his main boss at his current employer, or, you know, he's just not done much with it to this point because there's just no chatter out there and there's always chatter. I agree. We'll, We'll see what happens. And again, he's had some ongoing conversations with Kevin Steele, um, is that a situation where it could end up being, you know, Kevin Steele's? I, I don't know. I wouldn't rule him completely out. Uh, but I, my guess is Kevin Steele's probably wanting an answer sooner than rather than later. He's probably had enough office setting, Rob, at this point that, that I think he would like to know a direction that, that Josh Heupel is going to go with his defense. And if it's not Kevin Steele, then pay him his money and move on. And if it is Kevin Steele, then give him a title and move on. I think that's kind of where I would I would imagine that's probably where Kevin Steele is with it after sitting in the office, you know, twiddling his thumbs basically this week, getting paid. Only Tennessee can find itself in a situation where, you know, where some guy, I mean, it, it, it just, it's, it's bizarre, frankly. You know, they, they hire somebody you know, mere days before they, they completely clean house and he's got a guaranteed $900,000 deal and he's rolling into the office every day you know, not knowing what his fate is going to be. It's, just, it's like it couldn't happen anywhere but here. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. On to the next one. This is from NGA Vol. How realistic is it that Tennessee escapes with a one-year bowl ban and a loss of less than five scholarships? When do you anticipate a decision by the NCAA? And who's the best chance to be the starter at quarterback in Heupel's system? Um, let, let's, let's go with – Rob, let's start with the NCAA stuff. In terms of a decision – I think it's going to be a while in terms of the significance of, of those penalties. I, I, I think we'll just – we'll have to wait and see if the NCAA says more on the coach and less on the school because of the way Tennessee handled it. Or are they going to try to make an example out of Tennessee? I mean, I, I, I'll be stunned if it's just one-year bull band and five, and five total scholars. I mean, I think Tennessee would – Tennessee would love that. I mean, don't, do you not think that they would they, – they, they'd be high-fiving and dancing around the room? They, I think they would run like they stole something. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think they would be elated with that. Um, so, you know, we'll, again, I, I think what Tennessee is hoping is that they've kept everybody in the loop. They took swift action. Uh, but again, you never know how the NCAA is going to rule on something. You don't know, um, you know, what kind of mood they're in with it. Are they going to make an example? Or are they going to say, hey, th this, this school did it the right way. They handled things uh, swiftly and made tough decisions, didn't just take care of coaches. They cleaned out the entire recruiting staff and all those things. Um, so, you know, anybody who says they know how the NCAA thinks completely uh, doesn't know. I, I think the Glacier group certainly has a feel, has a better feel than most. That's why everybody uses them. Uh, but exactly what the NCAA is going to say, I don't have any idea. Best chance to be the starter at quarterback in Heupel's system. I'll I mean, go I just, Hendon. I'm going to go Hendon Hooker. Uh, I, I just don't think it lines up for Harrison Bailey. I just don't think he fits the system. I mean, like, you've got to be somewhat mobile. I mean, he's not a total statue, but he's still not – you know, I think mobile enough and, and you got to throw it vertically. And, and I think that lines up for a guy like Hendon Hooker or maybe even a guy like Caden Salter, who I think has got a ton of arm talent. Brian Mauer's got arm talent, but can he pick up this thing uh, mentally? Um, you know, and how, how complex is the system? I think that goes a long way to determine who's the quarterback because they're going from Jim Chaney's system that had, you know, Oh, so, so many complexities uh, that I think it really kept kids off the field to now, you know, Josh Heupel's, how, how complex is it? I don't know. You can install it in spring practice, AP. 15 practices, yeah. you can get it installed. Here's the thing that I that I don't know and why I think it's just – and obviously the person just wanting us to guess anyway. But, you know, who's got the competitive juice, the moxie, if you will, that, that Josh Heupel has talked about in every interview he's done when asked about the quarterback? Because he's made it very clear. He's had tall guys, short guys, fast guys, slow guys – you know, mobile guys, non-mobile guys, and he keeps coming back to, uh, you know, a guy with the moxie and the leadership skills and, and, and the guy who, um, you know, can, can carry things through, through, you know, when it gets tough. And, and who is that? Is that Hooker? Is that Salter? Is that Bailey? I don't know what – I mean, I think the guy who shows the mental side uh, in spring practice uh, of being able to handle some of those situations – is going to have a great shot to win this job, regardless of whether he physically fits the system uh, as well as maybe somebody else can. I just don't know who that guy's going to be. We'll have to have to wait and see uh, what it looks like in spring practice. Hopefully we'll get a chance to see some of that. But it'll be a heck of a competition uh, with a lot of guys trying to figure out exactly, you know, if they do fit in this system. And at the end of spring practice, we'll see who wants to stay in this system or if there's somebody who – you know, wants to, to bolt and, and head elsewhere after being in, after being in this thing. So it uh, will be a fascinating spring practice. Hey, LF Vol wants to know two topics. Given the disappointment in the search results of some big boosters, any rumblings of pulling back on funding? Second, with limited staff retained in the recruiting office or coaching staff, who is able to hand off or educate a new staff not used to fishing in these waters uh, in terms of Tennessee's recruiting targets? Um, and, and their, you know, coach relationships, that type of thing. How big of a concern is that? I'm going to take the first one out of the gate. I, I know that Jimmy Himes tweeted out something uh, that a, a booster said he was done giving money to Tennessee because Tennessee was paying all the buyouts that they were paying and, and kind of throwing money away. Um, and I think there are frustrations with that. But I don't think this is a situation where Tennessee is going to have a large pullback on funding by, you know, by a couple of big donors or two or three big donors. I think there's some people frustrated, uh, but I think that's something you can settle down and, and calm, you know, people down with. I'm not saying they're going to sell out all their sky boxes and all that, but I don't think this is a situation where they've got a bunch of people who are saying, Hey, I'm no longer going to give to the athletic department because they didn't hire quote, a big name coach or are the coach, everybody, you know, hope that they were going to hire or anything like that. As for the second part of the question, Austin, I, I think this is a significant situation for Tennessee and for well, Josh Heupel and his staff because nobody in the recruiting office was there to help Josh Heupel, has been there to help Josh Heupel understand the landscape, whether that's no. Rock Taylor, whether that's the state of Tennessee, whether that's 22s, whether that's 21s, uh, to some degree, whether that's the returning roster. I think the learning curve has been fast and steep to try to get somewhat caught up to date and keep from drowning in that, in that front. I think it's a, a topic that's probably not been talked about enough. I agree. And, and here's, you know, 
in years past, there was a skull all tizer there during a coaching change to help the transition. Or when Butch got fired, Bob Welton was here before he took his brief, you know, vacation in Nebraska before he headed to Tuscaloosa, um, you know, to help with the transition. There was nobody here to help with the transition, to tell, you know, Josh Heupel or Halsley or Golish, even though those guys are not technically hired, um, <laughs> you know, or Brandon Lawson or any of those people that are in the building. Hey, here's the deal. Here's why we didn't sign Rock Taylor in December, blah, blah, blah. When that happens, and let's face it, do you think when, you know, if you really go back, I mean, Josh Heupel's been on the job a week. Like, look how much stuff he's having to tackle in the first week. I don't think Rock Taylor was really at the top of the list. So I don't think there was any kind of um, knowledge of, of any of that stuff going on, you know, and, and, and what to do. And, and obviously, you know, that thing wasn't perfect. But to me, that was not on Josh Heupel. He was left to clean up a mess that, you know, I had Jeremy Pruitt still been the coach here, I would bet the farm he's not signing Rock Taylor uh, on, on Wednesday either. Yeah, I think it's been tough. I mean, I think when you walk in that kind of situation, it's, um, it's just a, a, a tough situation, you know, tough deal for sure. Um, all right, let's keep rolling here um, with uh, the next question is, has Hypo reached out to high school coaches in the state to get to know them? Heard Pruitt didn't do a good job of that. Uh, Austin, I think that they've made some calls there to introduce themselves. Uh, but, you know, those have been quick, I think, pretty brief calls, uh, just trying to say, hey, here, who, here's who we are. We're, we're in the state. We're going to go to work in the state. I, I do think they have tried to run through some of those calls pretty quickly to introduce themselves to some coaches across the state. Not any of them, or, or not all of them, um, but, but certainly some key guys across the state. I, I think they have done that. Yeah, and they've sent out they've sent out mass text messages just to say, hey, the state's important to us. You know, we're going to be in touch with you soon. I expect them again to focus, you know, a, a lot on the state of Tennessee, uh, and and we'll talk about some different names coming up uh, in the in the war room uh, late Thursday night, early Friday morning, uh, of some guys that Tennessee's going to, I think, at least really kind of target and, 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 and kind of see where they are with things. But, you know, this, this in-state class is, it's not just, you know, the high end guys like Ty Simpsons and, you know, Dallin Hayden and those guys, there are some really good, I think, mid-level guys that can really help this program. And, and to me, Tennessee needs to target those guys because with the possible sanctions, they need to be able to go ahead and, and build with some of those key players and then hope they can land the Dallin Hayden, Haydens and Ty Simpsons and, and, and those type of players. Speaking of that, AP, are, are we sure Hubbard's really reading the questions down? Because we've not had a Ty Simpson question yet. We're like 10, 15 minutes in. I'm getting there. I'm rolling into a Ty Simpson question. Um, and the question that this is the first, there's multiple Ty Simpson questions in there. We, we also got a question in there, Rob, about who are the older couple that wear the orange blazers and sit at the bench near at, at nearly every Tennessee basketball game? Whole man away. Earl and Judy. Earl baby. and Judy, baby. Earl and Judy's always there, right? And unfortunately, they were there to see that that debacle in Oxford on Tuesday night where Tennessee was just bad on a lot of fronts. I I, 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 I know this happened, but I'm trying to, th- trying to remember which tournament it was. I think it was the one – I think it was when um, Bruce was in Disney – years ago at the pre-Thanksgiving tournament, Earl actually, like, they have an off day in there. You know, play the three three games, maybe they play – I can't remember if they play two and then have an off day and play one. Uh, but Earl flew home on a Saturday after two days in Orlando to go to, to go to Tennessee's football game and then flew back for, like, the championship game against Gonzaga. Earl and Judy don't miss much, that's for sure, when it comes to Tennessee athletics. Uh, mainstays uh, in terms of traveling with the balls. They are not staffers. They are not staffers. That's for sure. All right, let's get to these Ty Simpson questions. Uh, how much headway is Hypel made with the in-state 22 class? If Ty commits elsewhere, who in the class is viewed as one who could pull or has influence with the other 22 guys in state? I've said it before. I'll say it again. Ty Simpson and Dallin Hayden to me are, are the ones that they'll you know, set the tone. Ty Simpson, we'll see if he does something on the 19th. I'm not entirely convinced he doesn't push it back. Uh, you know, we'll see. Um, as for Dallin Hayden, 
I don't see him doing anything until he's able to take some visits. If they let, you know, look, if, if at some point, and I, I continue to go back to this, I'm going to beat this horn. At some point, they're going to, or beat this drum, uh, the, they're going to open things up, you know, with, with the, you know, the different things going on. So let's see if they, you know, there's more optimism now about April than there ever was about any other time last year. Um, just because it's just further into this thing and people are learning to live with it. The vaccine's getting distributed, even if it's not getting distributed to 17 year olds or, you know, that are taking visits, it's still getting distributed out there um, to more and more people. So, you know, we'll see if they open things up in April, but to me, it's those two, um, you know, but again, you kind of got two different factions. You got kind of that Tennessee select, which is, you know, Horton, James, Cam Miller, you know, Dallin Hayden, Ty Simpson. Then you've got the MPA crop, which is, you know, Barry on Brown, which is the Wade twins, Fisher Anderson, Jacob Hood, go right down the line. So, um, you know, I, I think Tennessee will make both sides a big priority in 2022. As far as the other side with the MPA crop, the Wade twins, I think, carry a lot of weight and, and they're ones that are leaders. All right, let's go on to the next one here. Would it be an option to have the spring game on a Sunday this year? I think it would be more important than ever for this new staff to show recruits what the offense and defense would look like. So instead of trying to go against other SEC schools on Saturday, play the game on Sunday when you have it to yourself. What are your thoughts? Uh, I think from a TV standpoint, if you play it on Sunday, you might not get it on TV. And I think that everybody is wanting to will, will want to play those games on Saturday. So um, I, I don't I don't see that uh, I don't see that being an option. I think Austin, you talked about this. I think it's a good point, but with you know, if they open it up in April, I think you're going to see uh, some teams try to play their spring games later in April than in previous Agreed. years. If they if they can if that's a possibility as they set their schedules here. I know if I was Tennessee, I would. That's me. That's it's more important for Tennessee to play that game during an open period than it probably is any of the other blue bloods in this league. And also remember, those spring semesters going to end or end earlier than usual when there's spring break. Oh, and, that's uh, a good point. Sending the kids home for finals. That's a good point. I, I'm not sure what those dates are, I, although I, I should know since I have a, a freshman affected by it. But uh, He'll let you know when you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's a good point. I mean, it, you know, you, you're not going to keep kids around for a spring game, so you got to get your spring stuff done before that semester ends. There's no doubt about that. I hadn't even thought about that one. Um, AP confirmed something in the Tuesday pod that I had often wondered about. That being, if you guys ever offer advice to coaches, AP said he told the previous staff they needed to recruit other quarterbacks besides Ty. What are some interesting suggestions or tips you've given previous staffs, and how did they turn out? Mm, I mean, advice might be – I don't know about advice, but I know about – I talk to – you know, and you guys do too. It's more about, you know, perception stuff that that they wouldn't think about. You know, I mean, at least least for me. I mean, how, how, things, how things they're saying or doing is going to is being received by the fans that, you know, probably wouldn't cross their mind. Perfect example is the fact that, you know, when you're calling these in-state kids, you know, you know the group you're calling. You can't call two. Like, if there's five guys that play seven on seven together, you can't call two of them and not call the other three and the other three not know about it. Like, you know, you've got to be very smart about when you do the way you, the way you do things. Like, and I think those are things that coaches don't think about because, you know, they don't understand like, Hey, there's a group text. And, you know, if player X and Y hear from coach, you know, Jay, then, you know, the other three don't, then it's going to be a thing. So, I mean, it, it, I, I, I don't remember things that I've, you know, it's not necessarily advice. It's just kind of like, hey, do you think about the optics yeah. of how this looks when you do it? And like sometimes coaches just don't think in those terms because they don't see it from the, our perspective or a kid's perspective. Or in, in some cases, just a fan's perspective. They don't understand that, you know, nobody wants to hear how you did it somewhere else, you know, and and, and how they do it in another place. You know, they, they're not interested in those types of things. For a perfect example. You're bringing up Jeremy about bringing up the Alabama, Alabama stuff. Yeah. To take it to, to a butch level, nobody wants to hear that you've won nine of your last 13 games, but the four you lost were to, you know, <laughs> the teams you, they really want you to beat. Like, you know, I mean, like it, numbers are numbers can be twisted and used to your advantage either way you go. So, you know, it, it's just 
the messaging, the messaging on recruiting, the messaging to fans, all that kind of stuff um, is something I think that, you know, can be better. And that just isn't a Tennessee thing. That's everybody. Yeah. And then and obviously, I mean, you know, if you see something or you hear something that, you know, you think they might need to know about a particular player or something like that from time to time, if you've got a relationship with a coach, you might say, Hey, heard this might be something that you want to check on, or this might be, this guy may be really taken off or, or whatever, you know, cause I saw him at an event or something like that. That's just, that's kind of commonplace that that happens, um, you know, from time to time as well. All right. How worried are you about recruiting and development with the staff considering what Hypel has been able to do with a roster full of three stars? What do you think it's going to be like with Tennessee's roster um, and possibly what can Tennessee attract in future recruiting cycles? You know, I think the development part of it offensively, I mean, I think Josh Heupel scored points everywhere he's been. He's developed quarterbacks. He's developed skill guys. He's been a part of offensive staffs that have done that, whether it was in Oklahoma, Missouri, Central Florida. I mean, I don't, I don't worry about that. I, I wrote this the day Josh Heupel was hired. I think the defensive coordinator hire is the biggest thing uh, and, and the most critical thing for him because he's not a defensive guy. And I think he's got to have complete trust in his coordinator and let him go do his thing. The recruiting aspect of it, Rob, I think that's always an unknown when you bring in somebody who hasn't uh, recruited, you know, a, a ton in the SEC, and it doesn't look like his offensive staff, for the most part, is going to have a, have a lot of SEC recruiting experience or Power Five level experience. So that's always a question mark for me. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Aaron, I, I, I would just go, I mean, it could be done. I mean, people move up all the time from from small, you know, smaller jobs into bigger jobs and, and they have success. I mean, even, I mean, I don't think anybody remembers Butch fondly, but it didn't take long before, you know, a guy who had never coached in the SEC or coached at this level was banging out top 10 classes. I mean, that, I, you know, pretty, pretty apparent that it didn't work out well, but I mean, he was landing kids that, that had a lot of options. Well, that, was a hell of, that was a hell of a class he put together in year two. There's no doubt about that. But the Jalen Hurd. And yeah. guess what? It was all in-state kids. Yeah, yeah, top five. I mean, top five class. I mean, that's. I mean, it can be done. I mean, just because you haven't been a recruiter at this level, you know, doesn't mean that, that you can't recruit. And to, for me, I mean, the, the thing that I would be encouraged about if I'm a fan of Hypel is, I mean, Oklahoma's not in the SEC, but that's a big-time program. And he spent – over a decade there as a player and a coach. I mean, he knows, he knows what goes into recruiting at this level, what it takes, what elite classes look like. All right. Next question, given the changes to the roster this off season and assuming all players currently in the portal end up transferring out and that may not actually end up happening. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, who do you think are the players Tennessee most needs to needs to see, take their game to the next level next season. Obviously quarterback will be huge looking for players beyond the quarterback position. I think, Austin, it starts at linebacker, and the question at linebacker is who's going to be here at linebacker? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Quavaris Crouch is back. He's in school. Tennessee. I don't know that he's back, but he's in Knoxville. In no, he, I mean, he's going to go through spring. I, I've talked to people that he's talked to. He's going to go through spring. Now, I think if, I was, if you were asking me right now, I would still lean to him leaving uh, after spring, but I think he's going to go through spring. And then Henry – I continue to hear good, positive things about him. Now, we'll see. That one's went back and forth 54 times um, over the last, you know, months. So, we'll see if he ever gets back here. I don't think he's coming back this week. Maybe he gets back here next week or potentially the week after that. I do think, though, if he's coming, it's within the next 10 to 13 days. And then, you know, and the, the beautiful part of that is the fact he's able to take online courses, so he's not falling behind his schoolwork. All he's missing are some off-season workouts. And, he can make those up pretty quick, especially if he's staying in shape in California. I, for me, Brent, it's on the offensive side of the ball, and it's every position. The wide receivers got to take a step forward. They did not have a great year last year. How complicated is the offense? How much can they get on the field? Running backs, you lost your top two. Who can step forward and be that guy in Josh Heifel's offense? And then, of course, quarterback. What about you, Rob? Um, I mean, just like, I mean, I think it's obvious linebacker. I mean, if, depending on how the transfer portal stuff works out, you know, even with, I mean, I, I thought this last year, as did a lot of people, I mean, you think, you think the offensive line should be a strength. And if, if that is actually the case, then, then it's going to be something you can lean on. But I think developing that crop of sophomore wide receivers 
is going to be huge because I think we can all agree they got some really intriguing talent there. I mean, Jalen Hyatt looks legit. You know, Malachi Wyman is obviously a specimen. You got talent there, and then it, it needs to be developed. But I think they could really be an explosive unit. And they got to find some offensive tackles for sure. Burrow Bill wants to know: Could Tennessee sign fewer than twenty-five this year as a part of beginning what I'll expect to be a reduction in scholarships for the next one to three years? Um, yeah, I mean, they could self-impose that and, and say that's the case that they decided not to sign you know, their full allotment and, and try to do that. I don't know how much that would help them, but I mean, I'm sure that's something you could write up and put in a self-report uh, and a self-imposed deal. That doesn't mean the NCAA has to accept it, but you could try to do that if Tennessee elects not to bring in 25. I still think when you talk about transfers, I wouldn't be surprised to see Tennessee at that 20, 25 number when it's all said and done. Chase 2430 wants to know if Ty Simpson goes to Alabama or Clemson, Give us uh, who are the next quarterbacks that Tennessee would likely pursue and have a chance of landing. Same more. That's where I would start. He picked up the Florida offer on Wednesday, uh, continues to grow in, in terms of stature, in terms of uh, prominence on the recruiting trail. He's obviously got great ties to Tennessee. Uh, I, if I were Tennessee, that's where I would be going. In fact, I'd be having conversations with him now. That's no offense to Ty Simpson, but I, I wouldn't wait until that was over and, and hope to get, to get in there. Um, you know, when when you're out on the Ty Simpson deal, I would at least have a conversation with Sam Horn and introduce myself to Sam Horn if I was Tennessee staff. C.D. Vall wants to know, Rob, why doesn't the local media criticize Rick Barnes and why does Barnes never take any responsibility for his teams playing poorly? I mean, I think Rick gets I – mean, I, I don't know about – enough about basketball to criticize things, you know, from the, on an X and O level. I thought I was pretty – if you read anything I wrote on – you know, Tuesday, I thought I was critical of the team, personally. And um, as far as taking responsibility, I mean, I, I fans are way more into that than, than, you know, players are or coaches are. I mean, I can front I mean, people I, – I don't get over – I mean, I, I don't get how people get so upset when a coach doesn't come out there and say it's my fault. I'd say probably because Rick doesn't think it was his fault would be my answer to that. He doesn't see any merit in, in going out and – just doing that to appease fans. I'm sure it never crosses his mind. And I can promise you anything that he said about his team at a press conference, he had, he has said a lot worse to their faces. And I, I know we're talking to some people today that, I mean, certainly they felt like they were prepared last night and, and then they felt like their players didn't execute. They just gave, gave Ole Miss 18 points on turnovers. I, I don't get that. I mean, why, why people are so upset about a coach coming in and, detailing the reasons why he why they lost instead of saying i got to do a better job I mean, well right. a perfect example of that is is how many people under butch jones said you know all he does is throw the players under the bus he never takes responsibility himself okay so what did jeremy pruitt do rob jeremy pruitt came in and every, every time, time they lost he took it it was my fault ultimately it was my fault oh the offense wasn't very good ultimately the buck stops with me and then people got tired of hearing that so, it, it, again, I, I, I agree with what Rob's saying here because ultimately, you know, no matter what the coach says, fans end up annoyed by it because they're not winning. At the end of the day, if Tennessee's winning, it doesn't matter. Yeah, people just – people are upset after a loss you know, looking for a scapegoat. And, and like I said, I would say the biggest reason Rick didn't take responsibility is because he didn't feel like it was his fault. He's won 723 games, and he, he knows what goes into winning those games, and he didn't feel like his players got it done last night. Tuesday night. One other basketball question here. Um, why do you think that they do not post up uh, Keon uh, Johnson and Jaden Springer more inside? I think, they have do, I'll say, I think you'll see them do more of that. And uh, I think one of the biggest problems they had last night is because they hadn't really practiced it a lot. Folky was giving them just about nothing. He took five shots in the game. And what was missing uh, from the from the zone offense, I think the, that you've seen a Tennessee be really good at in the past was high, low action. You know, then being able to get it to about 12, 13 feet there in the paint and, you know, have the guy with a thread of, you know, putting the ball on the floor and making something happen and drawing a defender and then having a guy on a low block. And Fulke just, you know, didn't give him that option. Yeah, and we'll, we'll see what they find. I mean, they've obviously got to find some people that can – can put the ball in the basket and can get the ball to the basket. And, and, and they have a I mean, 
and they, I mean, they've done, Keon's obviously played some of the four, and I think you'll see them do more of that, but I don't think they've practiced a lot of that against zone. And so that when, when Folky kind of no-showed, they didn't have, they didn't have a counter. Austin, I thought I heard you mention this staff possibly having some orange to it. Is this something that remains on the table, meaning a possible, a possible hire outside of Kevin Steele, who has Tennessee ties? Well, I think they could have gotten that done with Monterio Hardesty, but Monterio was too far down the road to South Carolina. Uh, by the time Tennessee had a brief conversation with him on Wednesday, um, you know, he was he, he had just he had already agreed to become the, the running backs coach to South Carolina and uh, just decided to, you know, go that route. Um, you know, there's just not many names out there. I mean, people go bring up Dell Jones. I don't see that happening unless, you know, Josh Heupel decides to really kind of go out of left field. Um, Marion you know, Hobby, Casey Rogers. No, I don't see any of those happening either. So I mean, like, I don't, I don't necessarily see any orange on this staff um, compared to recent times. But again, Brent, you brought this up when we were breaking down coaching hires. Um, you know, over the last, you know, couple of coaching hires, Tennessee's always kind of go the opposite direction of whatever they've done, whatever they've been, whatever they've been doing. They've had a couple of Tennessee guys on this past staff with T and J. Um, you know, obviously that didn't work out. And so maybe they go the opposite direction, which means in a couple of years, sign one of those guys <laughs> that Rob just mentioned to come to Tennessee. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. It doesn't feel like there's anybody right now with, with great Tennessee ties that seems to be on the horizon. And we'll see what that defensive side of the ball looks like. Someone asking this podcast, we're quickly running out of time here, about Rodney Garner. Has there been any contact there? I do not believe there's been any contact with Rodney Garner our defensive coaches, because I think that Josh Heupel is wanting to, get, wanting to get the defensive coordinator hire done first. But I think Rodney Garner would certainly be interested in listening uh, to whoever the defensive coordinator is, not just Kevin Steele, uh, and talking about potentially returning to Tennessee. So we'll see if anything develops there. Next question, do you feel – uh, Is he fired with a buyout? Like, like still, or is he does yeah. his contract is expired? Okay. No, no, he, he's getting money from Auburn. He's got another year on, his, on a contract that runs June to June which is a bit of an unusual contract from a timing standpoint. So he does not roll into the final year of his Auburn contract until this coming June, uh, the way I understand it from everything that I've read. Um, all right, last question here. Do you feel like the university is truly aligned with the academic side to the athletic side now? And what's the greatest impact Danny White can make as an AD? As for question number one, um, no, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think you can say that, that based on the fact that Jeremy Pruitt's gone. Suddenly now the university and the athletic department are all tied in and everything's, you know, everything's great. There's not any issues or not any, you know, things that they have to deal with. I, I do think that the chancellor and the president um, understand the need for athletics to succeed more than some previous chancellors and presidents that have. I think that's a positive. I still think there are things that they are, everybody is working through to understand. I do think that the chancellor and the president are, are going to be more hands off and not, they don't want to be involved in anything on a regular basis with athletics, assuming that there's no need for them to be there. Um, I mean, are they more aligned than they were a few years ago? Yeah, probably are, uh, but there's still some relationship things that need to be repaired and worked through moving forward. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Second question, what's the greatest impact Danny White can make as an AD guys? I would think uniting the boosters on, on the same page. I mean, high level, get everybody, you know, not to sound, not to steal a quote from PJ Flight, get everybody rolling in the same direction, which is, is hard to do with, with, you know, super rich people that are used to getting their way. I'll go with just changing the game to atmosphere at Neyland Stadium. Well, he's innovative. Yeah, I think it's we'll, we'll outdated. See. It's stale. Hubs, you and I have had this conversation 47,000 times. Well, I, I think, and for me, I think the biggest thing, too, is what, what, what's Danny White's known biggest strength? It's fundraising, right? Marketing and fundraising. Tennessee's got financial woes. Can he go sell it? When Tennessee's not, you know, when Tennessee's got struggles and they're not winning and everybody's not just clamoring to come to, to your games or give you money, can, can you go sell it? Can you go sell it and get you know, get the, the donor base up and get the finances up because Tennessee's, you know, they're not, in, they're not nearly in as good a situation as most of the teams in the SEC are when it comes to finances, reserve, all those types of things. I know he's, he's talked to some people privately about really growing the budget, wants to really grow the athletic department. To do that, 
you got to go out and raise some money. And that's his, that's his greatest strength. So can he go do that in this program and, and with this department and the football program kind of where it's been the last few years? Um, he may find that tougher sledding than he thought, or maybe he doesn't, but uh, we'll see if he can work to his strength the way that he needs to. So um, those are a few of the questions you guys had. We tried to get to as many of them as we could in this edition of the VolQuest.com podcast brought to you by our friends at Blue Water Climate Control. But that's going to do it for this Thursday installment. And for Rob Lewis and Austin Price, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great Thursday and a great weekend, everybody.